You know, on the podcast in the next 24 hours, I've mentioned several times about my relationship with the amazing folks at McDonald's. Today, I'm very excited because we're going to have an owner, operator, and next genner join us and talk a little bit about some of the challenges and some of the amazing things that McDonald's has been doing to help us all through the pandemic and much more. Please join us. I think you might be surprised what McDonald's is doing to make our life better every day. Welcome to the next 24 hours, where I'm going to give you real information you can really use to transform your life and work one day at a time. I'll be your host, Curtis Zimmerman. Well, hello, everyone. So excited to have Stacy Voorhees here on the program today. Now, Stacy is an owner operator of a McDonald's. She's also something called a next genner. And Stacy's going to share with us all things change, all things restaurant of the future. McDonald's is constantly evolving and changing. And she's grown up in that culture. And we're excited to have her today. I'm happy to say not only is she going to be an amazing guest, but I also think she's an amazing friend and has worked with us many many times. Please welcome to the show, Stacy. Hello, Stacy. How you doing? Hi, Curtis. Good morning. I'm great. Thank you. Awesome. We're so excited to have you. You know, before we jump into the stuff I want to talk about, the restaurant of the future and obviously COVID and closing the restaurants, I wanted to see if you could give us a little backdrop of kind of your life and your parents, and what it means to be a next genner, and your brother, and you know, just the family dynamic, and how you guys, you know, bleed basically ketchup, which is awesome. Yes, and that it's a it's a crazy story, uh, but it's it's truly the American dream. And when I look at my family, and I look back at where we started and where we are today. It's God's grace that has got us to this point. It is truly remarkable. And as you mentioned, I am a second generation operator. And this all started uh, way back in the 80s when my parents had a vision and a dream to become McDonald's operators. And as we move forward in this podcast, you know, when we think of vision and goal setting, um, this story here is, is so important of, of how, when you set those things and you work diligently towards them, how they can actually become a reality. And it's funny how on January 1st, every year, many of us do set goals and dreams, but we just don't work towards them. But this story here is an example of, of the success and the victory that comes through fighting through all those challenges that come our way in life. And we have a choice. We either can continue the fight and the journey or stop. And so with that, you know, I am that second generation operator. My parents started uh, working at McDonald's uh, in Lima, Ohio and Wapakoneta, Ohio. That is where my parents met. Uh, They ended up getting married and they moved us. uh, I was two. My brother was six months. They moved us to Montana uh, when we were just youngsters to uh, work for someone they knew that just became a newly approved McDonald's operator. And, uh, you know, those were some challenging years. Um, imagine having uh, no family around. Uh, we had one car. Uh, we, those were some growing years. Uh, my parents made a lot of sacrifices um, that many of us, I don't think, would have done to reach their goals and their dreams. You know, we, we lived in Montana uh, for, for 15 years. My parents worked hard and worked through the ranks within that operator group. And then in 1990, my parents got their first restaurant in Lewistown, Montana. And that is in the center of Montana. Uh, if you ever get the chance to go, go. It's beautiful. They say it's big sky country. You'll never know what that means until you go see it for yourself. Uh, and I'm so excited in just four weeks. I'm taking my family out there to, to see where I grew up and let them see the big blue sky country. Uh, so within that, I started working at McDonald's uh, at the age of 13. Uh, I was on fries. I, I was the fry girl. And as <laughs> Curtis mentioned, I had ketchup in my veins and um, I learned everything from pancakes to buns. Uh, I, you know, I look back now and I'm so grateful that I was able to learn every single station because it gives me the ability to relate 
to every single person that works for me. If, if I'm changing a belt on the roof, I've done that. If it's cleaning toilets, I've done that. If it's mopping the floor four times, I've done that too. Uh, if it's dealing with someone who's passed out, we've done that too. And it, I love the ability to connect with my customers, internal and external at so many levels, just because of the experience that this job has brought. Many times, Curtis, people, I'll talk to people that used to work with me or for me that have moved on to whether they're a principal uh, or they're a claims manager at Prudential, you know, all these people. And they tell me they're so grateful for the foundation that McDonald's has brought to their lives. And that is one of what we're are saying that we're, we're saying today is that we are McDonald's America's best first job. And, and that truly is because that foundation that we are able to help solidify for so many is so strong that it carries on through their lives. And I personally can sweep floors at an excellent level because I had a closing manager that would not accept the sweeping job that I performed. And many times I had to re-sweep the floor. And yeah, I was aggravated, but I look back now and I'm so glad that that manager was tough on me for having excellent floors. I am today extremely picky about floors and how they look. And it took that manager being tough on me and saying, no, this is what I'm going to accept. It needs to be better. So within that, uh, you know, I did fries and my parents had that restaurant in Lewistown for five years. We then, uh, my parents got a call from the operator that hired them as crew people. He was getting ready to retire and he knew that their family was all out here in Ohio. And he said, Hey, do you guys want to move home? And they said, yes. So, uh, you know, us kids were not happy. Uh, we did not know these, these family members that well. We did not know Ohio. We knew Montana. And uh, they packed us up anyways. And my parents were able to buy the store they met in, in Wapakoneta, Ohio. How crazy is that? Will you tell that story real quick? Just tell us a little bit about how your parents met. So my parents met in Wapak. Uh, my mom was uh, training and my dad was there training and uh, my dad was awestruck that my mom handled all those kitchen boys the way that she did. So back in those days, uh, women in the kitchen was more of a taboo thing and it was kind of a transitioning point in McDonald's and more women were getting in the kitchen and usually uh, they were a little uh, vivacious and uh, could become her some and a little challenging to the ladies. And, uh, Mom just would not tolerate that. She uh, she stood her ground and uh, she gave them a run for their money. And my dad liked that. And so that was it. The sparks flew and here we are. And uh, that's where it all started. And, uh, you know, my mom is still that, still that way. <laughs> you, uh, you better know what you're getting into. She stands her ground. And uh, that's where it all started with the Wapak. And within that story, when we moved back and my parents were able to buy that restaurant that they met in, I then met my husband in that same restaurant. Oh my <laughs> that, gosh. I didn't know it, that. It is, yes. So we've actually had some newspaper articles done around Valentine's day about true love and et cetera, uh, that, you know, my parents met in Wapak McDonald's and then my husband and I also met at that same restaurant. So Wapak and and, and that restaurant has some very deep, roots and meaning within our family because so much started within the, those restaurant walls. So they moved us back in 1995 and, uh, you know, the, we, we grew from two stores to four stores. And to this day, we actually have nine restaurants. Uh, my brother and I partner together and, uh, he's got three restaurants in Indiana and then we have five, uh, here in Ohio. So within that, uh, you know, when I was, you know, I struggled with, you know, what I wanted to do a little bit. And I, I did some college and I, I worked my, my ways up with the McDonald's and I decided I wanted to do the family business. I, I love being with people. And my dad always challenged us to always leave people better than when, when they came to you. So whether they stayed with you or, or they moved on, that they were better. And that is still something we hold dearly that we always try to do no matter 
no matter what, is that th- these people, that there's been an impact, an impartation between us, that they are better than when they came. The other thing that we always do is give. We're always giving back to our community, to our people. Um, it's better to give than to receive. And we're big givers and believers that we always give back to our communities and are involved within them to make a difference, not only within our walls, but outside our walls. So that's a big thing we do. And, and in two, 1998, I set a goal to be an operator in 10 years. I made a 10-year plan. So this goes back to the very beginning of my parents setting a vision for their life. Well, then I set one for myself. And uh, it was not the best timing in 2008 because I was uh, seven months pregnant with my first child and we moved. So we moved uh, homes and it's a six month process. I would never want to repeat, but I got my first restaurant within having my first child and moving. Wow. Uh, what a process. Uh, but it goes back to, I wanted to say the, the, the vision and the plan And those 10 years were tough because sometimes Curtis, what happens is we become complacent and we get sick of the process and we put our hands up and say, you know what? It's just going to be easier if I just stay here. I, you know, I'm not going to push myself all that way, but I had to fight through that because there were years that were, were tough. There were years that I wanted to be complacent. There were years that I just wanted to not do it, but I stayed true to the vision. I stayed true to the goal. And you know what? In 2008, the goal became reality and then became a whole nother set of reality set in that, oh my gosh, wow, the bunk stops at me. I set the pace. I'm the example. And that that paradigm shift is, is, is challenging because my dad had been the, the pacemaker. My dad had been and mom were, were the examples. So I had to, my paradigm had to shift that as a leader, my leadership and my role was different. So that's kind of our story of, of how everything happened and, and where we're at today. Um, you know, the last part I'd add is uh, we are a mixed family and within our walls, my grandma still comes in, who's in her eighties and rolls burritos um, I have, you know, a couple aunts that work, some cousins. So we, we've always tried to keep the family feel. And also within that, we want every person that works for us and customers to come in that know that we're a family. And that's what's made COVID challenging for our customers and us is those relationships that we've built. It's so hard not seeing those people that have not that come in every day to not now see them every day. So it's it's challenged us as leaders to so how can we still connect with these awesome customers that we got used to seeing and uh, you know getting their phone numbers and calling them up and and checking on them is become a reality and uh, that's what we've done to connect with them. But that's a big piece of who we are as an organization is we're a big family. You know, it's interesting because I interview a lot of different people and um, very few companies have I worked so close with and, uh, than McDonald's. And um, the thing that I love the most about working with McDonald's and doing rallies and all the different things we've done is that what you're saying right now to people that are just listening, it just sounds like a you know a bumper sticker or kind of a campaign or and what I found is is that the people that work and own and run and manage McDonald's that have been doing it for years, they truly love people and they really, really are about the people and they love taking someone that's maybe going through a rough time or uh, has a challenging family life or maybe suffered with addictions or whatever. There's a million different things. And then helping those people kind of get themselves back on track, giving them kind of an on way, uh, you know, a runway onto the next thing or into the organization. And I love that your dad always says, you know, minimum wage does not mean minimum opportunity. And that that's his kind of philosophy. And I know that that bleeds through you and your brother. And so 
I just want anyone that's listening to understand this is real. And if you've ever worked at a McDonald's and you've had the counseling and the, you know, how things are supposed to be done right and why it's important. And that's why some people don't like to work there is because they don't want accountability. And I know the president of Bacardi, P. Carr, a friend of mine, he says that the two summers that he worked at McDonald's is part of his leadership style today because he learned so much then. And uh, I just think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the restaurant of the future, which is really when I was doing a lot of deep dives with McDonald's. And the concept was, let's bring uh, the old style of McDonald's and bring it into the future. And let's be the trendsetter rather than the trend follower. And a lot of people that were owner operators maybe had a restaurant for 20 years or they had 15 restaurants or, and they were kind of used to that complacency you were talking about. So there was a lot of blowback about it, but I want to get to the other side and talk first off, what did that look like for you? What did that mean for you and your family? But then also, wow, what did that do when COVID happened and how did that actually play out to bring us up to date? So tell us a little bit, just first off, if, if it was eight years ago and you just started hearing about the restaurant of the future, what did that mean to you and your family? Sure. Uh, there's a lot there because I remember when they announced <laughs> uh, the, the changes they wanted to bring and, and all the meetings that ensued following um, the vision casting and uh, showing the models and the scalability of the vision. And, you know, what they wanted to do was exactly what you said as the McDonald's of the future and that we were relevant and that we were meeting the needs of the consumer. And so within that, you know, obviously one of the first things that came to mind was the investment uh, and, you know, how are we, how are we going to lay this out to be financially viable and to carry through with these plans? The other was people, um, you know, how are people going to adapt to this, this new model? Um, and then our customers, you know, cause without the customer, that's, that's why we're here. Um, what does this mean for them? And what does this look like for them? And, that was, you know, the, the first step. And then obviously within all that is the, the planning and planning this all out and layering it into uh, your plans and, and making that become a reality. So within our organization, we have three restaurants left that, that need to complete the vision, if you want to say it that way, and to, to get up to the times. And within that, it's, it's all customer centric, things that make it easier for the customer. So, you know, you look at some of our restaurants that have been modernized and are, and are to that goal. Um, they're able to do uh, curbside delivery. They're, they're able to do the make delivery. You can do so much on your phone now that you were not able to in the future. Um, a lot more of our equipment is, is more, it meets the needs of our crew people better. It's more functional. It flows better. Um, you look at, you know, our Wapak location is, is testing where you can order from your phone and have the food delivered to your table, uh, which is not something we're doing. So as we look forward to what that customer wants, that's where we're at. And we look at delivery and how that has grown so much and people are ordering more in than going out is meeting that customer. And at that level, we look at loyalty and those kind of programs. And what does that look like for, for both sides of us? Um, so that's where it's going. It's exciting. Uh, but it's, it's also challenging because it's, as you said, uh, looking back eight years to where we're at, it's, it's holy smokes. That's a, that's the most change we've done in McDonald's. I think in, in our, in our past, or in, in, we've never changed this much. And, and you look at the structure of even the restaurant and, what it looks like today versus what it did. It's so different, but within the experience of the customer, we still want that to be at the center of everything we do, that they come to visit us because we have the great service. And I know Curtis, one thing you've always mentioned before is that a cheeseburger in Ohio tastes the same as a cheeseburger in Florida, that those elements within our business re remain true and that the quality is still uh, high, but that in regards to the experience that we're meeting the need of the customer at a higher level and at 
the pace and expectation that they've so come to to want from us. You look at uh, you know, Amazon and what they've done in their industry and how Amazon Prime is so huge. You get your stuff in a day or two. And, you know, we look within McDonald's and what is that customer wanting? And and how do we challenge ourselves to meet that need uh, that the customer wants? Because a big part of, of what, how customer uses us in our industry is speed and convenience. That is is the flagship of what we're known for. And so we got to continue to challenge ourselves as, as a brand to meet that need of the consumer. And that's the path we're on is meeting that need. And technology is a huge piece of how we're going to do that. So I thought I'd jump in here real quick because it's so great to talk with Stacy. It inspires me for all the work that we've done together in the years that we've done with McDonald's, doing virtual rallies, doing real rallies in person, but also all of the work we've done in individual restaurants. Now, if you have employees that you want to get fired up or if you're doing some virtual meetings that you think you might want to have me come on to, I would love to do that. If you want to get a hold of me, it's really simple. Just shoot me an email, curtis at curtiszimmerman.com. If you want to find out more about what we've done with McDonald's in the past, go to my website, curtisimmerman.com, and click on the big logo that says McDonald's. And now let's get back to our interview with Stacy. I just want to throw this out to all of our listeners. Imagine if you owned a restaurant and then somebody said, okay, I know you've been doing it this way for 15 years, 18 years, but I want you to make the entire inside of the building entirely different. I want you to do the whole operation and the way that the food is served and the way that it goes through the line. I want you to change all of that. I want you to do uh, a complete reboot, all things technology. I want to have kiosks where people can order to where they don't even have to talk to anyone. I want to give them a little thing, a little beacon that they can go and sit on their table so that then when the food's ready, we can have table side service. No, I know you've never done table side service, but we want to add that to you now. We want to have not a one lane drive through, but we want two lanes of drive through, which means you have to change the entire outline of your parking area and the way that the traffic flows and you might have to add a different exit to get in and out of the restaurant. We're going to do all these things and we want it done in a year or three or whatever the the deadline was. And then doing that across thousands and thousands of restaurants. Then and now you had people go, oh my God, that's crazy. We can't do it. But you had a lot of early adapters, people that And this happens with all change in all companies. That's why I want to throw it out. You have people that go, yes, I can't believe it. it's going to cost a lot, but I've been waiting for this because we need to compete with not one or two restaurants now in our neighborhood, but there are actually 13 competitors. So we have to change to the times so we can actually go back and dominate like we used to. Finally, woo, let's do it. Then you have the people that don't want to change. And the the question and the answer to this to everyone who's listening is, Think about doing all of that work and then something nobody knew, nobody could foresee, but COVID-19 happens and all of a sudden, all of the restaurants, the interiors are all shut down and in the industry of food and quick food and everything we just heard about, no one's better prepared and no one's people are trained as well to take online ordering, to do all the things it takes to service the community like McDonald's was set up to do. So I, I just want everyone listening to, to realize change oftentimes we're, we're expanding our knowledge, we're expanding what we're doing, not even knowing where it's going to help us in the future. Would you say that having the restaurants and having your people trained with all things online and all that, uh, online learning and um, everything it takes to order – in a different way than just walking up and placing an order where the person's punching the keys. Would you say that that helped you when the uh, pandemic hit and you had to close the restaurants? I, I just want to know from your, from your mouth, what was your take on being prepared compared to others? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we definitely, from a brand perspective, were in a great position. Uh, as, as you mentioned, that we were able to capitalize on uh, being ahead. And, and many of those facets. Um, and honestly, you know, during, during this, it's, it's been refreshing to, 
to look at the new normal, to realign and, uh, you know, bring in best practices, learn from others. And within McDonald's, as you said, we're, we're always trying to be on the cutting edge of, of what's coming and, and what's ahead. And, you know, technology is huge and mobile ordering and delivery. Those are all huge things. So yes, to what you're saying, we were definitely prepared and we were able to shift, uh, our manpower to really execute that drive through at an even higher level because that was the focus. There was really no other focus at that time, but okay, this is where our customers are. There's no inside. So we're going to crank that baby and fine tune it and finesse it even more. I've, I've had many of my staff say, wow, I've learned a lot about the drive through that I just didn't know, you know, cause my, my, my focus was shifted sometimes maybe where it shouldn't have before, or maybe it was somewhere that they should have focused, but they learned a lot during, during this. And, you know, that's the great thing about going through these things is you never let a crisis go to waste. And that's been a challenge for us. You know, yes, it's not been the funnest and yes, it's been challenging. And would I want to go through this again? Not to this extent, but can I take things away and challenge my mindset? Yes. Um, you know, within that, you know, mindset matters. And, you know, if you think you can, you're right. And if you think you can, you're right also. Most people, Curtis, lose the battle first with their eyes. They get so distracted in what they see that it opens the door to lose the battle over their heart and their mind. Mm. And entering battles, then they're entering battles they weren't called to. Because once we see things and then we've lost heart, with, we've lost the ability to see the hope within our heart and mind. We're not even fighting the battle we were called to. And I firmly believe that each one of us uh, individually and then within our business or whatever you're doing, we have a purpose. We have a paddle. We have a mission. We have a conquest. And we lose those battles oftentimes because we've lost the battle over our heart and mind because we lost the battle with our eyes. We lose the mission that we're called to do. And that ties into something that's very passionate within me is passion and purpose are magnets. And many times when I see people, I either see them that they have met their, their, their passion and their purpose, but then I also see the opposite of people that are so unpassionate about what they do, which then leads into they're not living their life purpose. So when I get the ability to speak at high schools or venues of that such, I really bring to light the magnets of passion and purpose are drawn together. And within our company, that is a, a big thing for myself is I'm passionate about what I do, which leads into the purpose of what I do. And, you know, I wanted, I wanted to hit into that, but within that, within COVID, because I have a passion and a purpose, COVID can't get in my way. It, it, it might be a bump. It might be a stumbling block to some degree, but I, my passion and purpose are still there and I still see them. I, I still see that the light is in the tunnel. This is not going to stop me. It's not going to, because my mindset has been made up. So no matter what you're doing, who's listening and what you're involved in challenge to what you're looking at. And when we think of what we're looking at, whether that's Facebook or the news or whatever, what, what you feed yourself is going to come out. And so I challenge us to monitor our diet mentally and with our eyes, because again, the battle oftentimes is lost with what we see. So within COVID, you know, blessed are the flexible. They don't get bent out of shape. And as Curtis mentioned, <laughs> if there's one brand that is adaptable to change, it's us. So honestly, COVID, uh, my gosh, the amount of changes that McDonald's and the government has thrown at us, it's like, okay, okay, what's next? We're ready for tomorrow. Yes, it's been a little over the top. And uh a lot, maybe more than we're accustomed to, but within McDonald's, that is, if you don't like change, then McDonald's is not for you, even pre COVID. It just is the way this brand works. We're always changing. And that has given us the leverage to move and be nimble at a fast pace and change directions from a large scale very quickly, which is hard to do when you have 14 some thousand restaurants in the United States. And within that, Curtis, change isn't always bad. And within this, we have found some things, as I was telling you, even with my managers, that we're able to glean from. 
And as I just mentioned before, we're, we're not letting this time go to waste. We have been training and encouraging ourselves even more so than we were before. Our training is at a new level because we went into this saying, what's our vision? How are we going to come out of this better than before? Because that's our mindset is we're coming out better. We're coming out stronger. We're going to be we're going to be so much more prepared and better off than we were before because we took the time to plan and settle down and not look at everything, but say, how can we come out of this at a different place than maybe where some others are? Many times these challenges cause us to dig deeper. And within that, we can flourish. And I just want to bring up two things. You look at a tree. And a tree's roots get stronger for many reasons, but a lot of times the adverse winds are what causes the root of a tree to go deeper. And also droughts do. You think of a drought being bad, but a lot of times a drought causes a tree's roots to dig deeper for water. And that's where we're at, Curtis, with COVID is it's challenging us to dig deeper within ourselves and within our companies for that water, that gold, that liquid gold of how can we challenge ourselves as leader in a business to use this opportunity, maybe in a way that we did not think was possible, you know, before. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I I just, the passion when you talk, it's, it's, it's like why I wanted you on the show so bad because you are just like the screaming example of motivation, passion, people, love, and seeing a challenge as a good thing, not getting, um, you know, totally blown away and blown up by it, but instead saying, how can we blow this up and come off the other side better? And that's just, it's, it just comes through in your voice. And I want to try to just paint the picture for people. So you said that when you got your first restaurant, you it just moved and you just had your first baby. And so where are you now on the, on the baby scale and what are the ages? Because I want to give people after that speech, I want to give people a look at a day in the life of you and what it really means to be a modern day, amazing owner operator like yourself. Give us an update of what, what's your what's your life like? <laughs> okay, well, I got three kids, 12, 9, and 7. My 7-year-old just so had a birthday yesterday. Um, it's it's busy, but I've challenged myself not to use the word busy uh, because so many times we run into people and it's how are you, I'm busy. Uh, so much to the extent that sometimes people don't reach out because they think you're too busy all the time. And so within that, I've had to challenge my own team to say, you know what, I, I am busy. But if you would simply reach out, I'll plan you in my day. I will, but I, I'm a, I have to plan. And so being a leader in this industry and being a mom and a wife and, and all the other things that um, I do, it, it is busy, it's challenging, but it requires structure. It requires a high level of organization, planning, accountability, um, all those things. So a, a day in the life of, of me, so example for, let's just pick today, I'm I'm doing this today on the podcast. I was awoken at 2 a.m. by my seven-year-old having a nightmare. So we got through that, followed by the dog, then woke up, and then I couldn't get to sleep. (laughs) Uh, And so uh, it's okay. We're going to push through the day. I will be in a restaurant for lunch, and I will be working with my people, challenging mindsets, timing things, tasting things, making sure that what we're giving our customers is what they expect. Um, And then this afternoon, I will be following up with emails, following up with my teams, checking numbers, holding that line of accountability, trust, but verify. Um, Then tonight, we're actually going to go visit uh, a friend and see some of the animals she's got. And then it'll be time for bedtime and that routine. Uh, And then we'll start the day all over tomorrow. Um, Every day is is different. Some days there are routines, uh, you know, such as uh, Wednesdays is a big meeting day within our company, whether it's together or separate. That, that we kind of hold that day for for meeting with people and being aligned. Um, so that that is a day within that. So to balance it all, balance is a big word. There are times within this that you know the business takes more time and the family does not get as much time. 
Then there's other times that you can pour more into the family side and the business doesn't get as much. So uh, there, it, it is, there is a balancing act that, that does take place here. Um, and I won't say it's easy. I think as women, we struggle a lot with guilt. Um, we carry that more so than maybe men do. I can't speak for men in that matter, but um, I've had to overcome that and, and challenge myself to be more planned out with my kids and um, learning that you know, buying them things is not what they need, but it's that one-on-one time or the playing the game. Um, those are the things that matter to them or tickling or hide and seek. Uh, they just, they just want you. They don't want things. And I've, I've changed in that matter that before I would go to the dollar store and, and feel better that I bought them something, you know, a chapstick or a lipstick or uh, a teenage ninja, ninja turtle uh, when all they wanted was me. And uh, with my husband, we have to be very thought out. And when's our date night? When are, when are we going to go do things? So we have to be planned out because whether it's McDonald's, my kids or my husband, uh, you have to really plan that out and be purposeful in that relationship. Because if you're not feeding it, then it's more than likely in that process of dying. So uh, that's, that's how I handle that process. And I hope I answered that. The, can you repeat the question? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's amazing. And, and what you do and what you give every day is amazing. And just, you know, it's a, a testimony to your belief in all things possible. And, you know, your parents who I love, like, uh, so, you know, I was so honored your, your mom and dad received a huge award. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. The one uh, at the, the net, the, the, what is it? The golden arch award. Yeah. So I know your mom and dad received the golden arch award, which is like one of the highest achievements you can reach. And they were able to go and receive this big award with all the other winners. And I had the honor to come with your family and be there. Yes. And that was like one of the biggest honors ever for me. And it happened to be happening at the same time as the national convention, which only happens every other year. And there are so many tens of thousands of people at that. And I was able to get in and go to that. And we don't, I don't even know when the next one of those will happen due to COVID and all that. So, um, just that you're kind of a living legacy and they are kind of legends in the McDonald's world. And when you speak, the passion for what you do is there. I wanted to end our time together with having you share maybe a couple um, heartwarming stories. I know that your father was telling me about um, some of the notes that uh, have come through the drive through and some of the response you've been getting from people because you never did close down. So a lot of people, you know, closed down and they had to stay home and watch Netflix. Well, you geared up and you were an essential business. So you never, you, you've never had that break, have you? No. And, you know, what we did is we started internally and made sure that uh, our people felt safe that our people felt valued and appreciated. And so we first started there. That was number one. And that started with a letter that went home to every home. We mailed it, uh, which with nine restaurants was a lot of work. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't advise having a 12 year old and nine year old help you because it became, uh, it wasn't the best family experience, but they helped, uh, stuffing letters and stamping and some stamps were upside down and Uh it's okay. We got the letters out, but, um, so with, with these letters came coupons that these employees could give to their family members, uh, during this time, because we knew, you know, there were some hardships out there. So that was in there. We also, during this time, Every employee ate free at work. There was no, um, you know, discount, you know, half off like before they were able to eat free. So we kind of freed that up for them as a blessing. That was, as we said, number one within that we, we moved to, okay, our customers, how can, you know, as you say, have these golden moments with these customers. So the first one that comes to mind is I was in cold water last week and, um, you know, we were open for takeout and, this elderly man comes in and uh, I was at the counter at the time. So I took his order and I told him it was $5 and, and 27 cents. And he says, 
you've got to be kidding me. And I thought he was really mad. And he's like, you're going to charge me that for a quarter pounder and a fry? And I said, well, yeah. And he goes, well, a bushel of wheat's only $4.97. And so long story short, we ended up talking for 45 minutes. Um, and I met this guy named Charlie. He's 78. He's a farmer. And uh, he invited me to come to the farm with my kids uh, to come learn what real hard work looks like. Um, <laughs> it was a phenomenal conversation. And for me, it reinforced how important relationships are just as a human being. But then even within our industry is people want to connect. They, they want to know that you care. And that's what is somewhat challenging within this new world, but even pre-COVID is we have a generation um, of iPhone users that that's their way to communicate um, and face-to-face is hard. So in some respects, COVID has hurt us in that way because they can hide behind a mask. And that will be a challenge moving forward is how do we make this generation comfortable communicating face-to-face when we've had masks and they still have their phones. Uh, but back to Charlie, what a refreshing conversation with Charlie, uh, just to get to know him, but that he was so thankful we were open because he's not real, you know, not a drive through guy. He wanted that interaction inside. We've also had several letters and just people thanking us. I had one lady say, Stacy, thank you for being open. Uh, you're the only thing left normal in my routine and my day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that meant a lot because sometimes we take for granted what we do and who we service and who we impact. But it all comes back to me. What we said at the beginning is leaving people better off than when they, they came. And to me, seeing that smile uh, on that customer's face or that crew person's face and seeing lives changed is what it's all about. So we had so many teenagers that were so from an internal perspective, so excited to come to work because they were so sick of their family and being at home uh, <laughs> that actually that worked in our favor. They were excited to come to work. And um, to me, the epitome of, of what we do is wrapped up in a, in a story of one of my supervisors that this girl and the home life that she came from, she was well on her way to be a statistic. She was well on her way to repeat the cycle. and. Uh, through a lot of love and coaching and her ability to make her mind up that she was not going to be a a cycle repeater. She is making more money than most people in her. I think anyone in her family, Um, she is thriving. She has got the magnet of passion and purpose in her life. She is impacting people's lives through foster care because she wants to give back because of, she knows what she came through And to me, to be a part of that, to help influence her, and now she's helping influence other people, that's what this is about, is changing lives and and seeing people transform. And did you guys do uh, free food for uh, first responders here in Ohio? We did. uh, We did. We did free food here. And then we did, well, first it started with free coffee, and then it moved into free, free meals. Yep. It was called the thank you meal. And about how many of those would you guess your nine restaurants gave away? Just ballpark. Uh, Any 2000. idea? It was, it was one week. Uh, was it a two weeks? I think it was a two week time frame, and we gave away 2000, if I'm not mistaken. It was right around that range. Wow. That's, yeah. that's crazy. And that's the kind of stuff that I wish was on the news every night about McDonald's. Right. You know, and it, that's why, though, we at a local level have to help change that narrative. And I think that's why at least in our area that we're sitting in a better place is because we're daily engaging in those conversations, whether it's the Facebook group uh, that says eat local and and McDonald's is listed as a place not to visit um, because I'm not local, but I have to jump into that conversation and say, wait a minute, raise my hand. I live right down the road from you. I am local. Those are things that um, at a higher level from a brand perspective are not happening, but you know, these media agencies control these Facebook pages and it's just, they, they can't do the job justice, you know, in these social media conversations. And that's why we actually pay $3,000 a month for someone to help us manage that locally. And we don't even use the platform McDonald's has, uh, which is Facebook, but we don't allow them to 
control the narrative. We want that narrative from every angle to be managed by us at a hyper sensitive level to make sure that our story is getting out there. Cause like you said, no one's saying these things. I mean, no, there's no ad in the paper that said we did thank you meals, but we have to continue to tell that story. What's interesting for me is that, cause I do a lot of work with marketing and advertising and even PR groups. And what's so funny to me about this is that you only want the truth told. So it's not like we're going to put out this marketing because we're doing such a poor job. We have to cover up for it's it's really no, no, no. We just want to be represented for what we're yeah. really doing. Right. And that's where it's just it's it's disheartening because whether it's us or COVID or what pick pick the narrative, it, they're, they're always finding the bad story in something. Um, it's like every day, like today, I got the paper. It's a new COVID update with two more cases. But yet there's never a story highlighted about the positive. And that's why I tend to be the, the ultimate positive. I'm always optimistic. That's my personality. But within that, yeah, I do need to, to recognize sometimes the other side more than I do and the realities of situations. But I always tend to think, how can I overcome the odds? But within that, I wish that the newspapers and et cetera would have, okay, here's a story of recovery. Um, or That's why we choose to go that route of, um, how are we impacting though, even during these times? So all I can tell you is, is that it's heartfelt. It makes my heart so happy because I can tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt, the experience of me, uh, meeting your father and your mother and your brother and you and it, all of my Mick family, as we call it, has definitely left me better as, as a father and as a man and as a business person. And so when you go to sleep tonight after that long day you've been talking about, I, I just want you to know that uh, there's one more person out there that's better because of what you guys do. So from my heart and to your family, stay safe, uh, keep the food hot and, you know, keep the people coming through the drive through And we obviously wish you the best in your business and with your family. And thank you so much for joining us today on the next 24 hours. Have an amazing day. And of course, keep living the dream. Thank you, Curtis. You too. Thank you. And now it's time for my favorite part of the program, the 24-hour challenge. I'm very excited about this one. It's going to be really simple. All I want you to do is get yourself a piece of paper. And at the top of the paper, I want you to write, to my friends at McDonald's. That's the header. Then I want you to write a personal message, a very short personal message, something like, I just wanted to say as a customer, thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you for all the work you've done during these hard times. I appreciate you. Keep up the great work. That's all I want you to say. Just put it on a piece of paper, any little story. Hey, I get coffee here every Tuesday. I drive through every morning. Thank you so much. You give my life normalcy. Whatever it is you want to say, but I want you to write it in the next 24 hours. Get the piece of paper out, write it. Then I want you to fold it, and I want you to put it in your car. That's the 24-hour challenge. Write it, put it in your car. Then the next time you find yourself at a McDonald's drive through the next time you find yourself coming up to the window and placing your order, I want you to remember that little piece of paper you wrote. And I want you to grab it. And when they hand you your treats, when they hand you your little bag, when they hand you your coffee, I want you to hand them the envelope and say, thank you for what you do and drive away. That is your 24 hour challenge. Let's look at the people every single day they're having an impact on our lives. And let's go out of our way to thank them just a little bit. That's the 24 hour challenge. Do that and I guarantee you're going to live the dream in a whole new way. Also, just one more thing I wanted to mention before I let you go. You know, this is the end of season three of the next 24 hours, and I'm going to take some time with my family, but I'll be back with new and exciting content on September 8th for season four. I look forward to talking to you then, and until then, keep living the dream.